up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. Today with me, I have Kyle Toffer, who is an environmental scientist and member of Scientist Rebellion. During our conversation, we talk all things climate change. Enjoy the conversation, and thanks for listening. Kyle Topfer, the rebellious scientist. Welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Rook. Thanks for having me on, guys. So, I mean, there's a lot to get into. And I first, I mean, the first question is, um, if you want to go ahead and explain to our listeners uh, a little bit about the IPCC report, what that is and your interpretation of it, that'd be great. Because there's a lot of people that are going to be listening that have no idea what this is or what Scientist Rebellion is. So quick background would be helpful. Sure. Um, let's start off with what the IPCC is fundamentally. Uh, so when it was determined that um, that governments needed to begin taking action on climate change in, throughout the 80s, they formed a body um, pulling all, together all the best scientists in the world and, and named it the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now that falls underneath uh, the United Nations Framing Convention on Climate Change. There's another one for you, UNFCC. See? And this is all part of the the, the uh, United Nations Environment Program. Um, so in 1990, I believe the IPCC re- produced its first assessment report. And I'll just give you a very quick quote from that report because it's interesting. Um, bear with me one second, sorry. Um, hey, no worries, man. So in that very first report, they wrote, 1990, the size of this warming is broadly consistent with predictions of climate models, but it is also of the same magnitude as natural climate variability. Now, the IPCC produces these reports approximately every five to seven years. Um, They've been every seven years since since 1995, the second report. Um, And throughout the the, the subsequent, so there was assessment report two, three, and four. Um, And then number five was the last one, which was produced in 2013. So by 2013, that that language had changed to this evidence for human influence has grown. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. So you can see there's a bit of a language change as the science became ever more clear uh, and the models became ever ever more complex and and with modern computer technology and and uh, modern data analysis and everything. This latest report is the assessment report six. Now, um, that 2013 assessment report five um, didn't lay out exactly how dangerous the the difference was between a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures and a two degree rise in temperatures. Now, when we talk about that rise, it's very important to distinguish. We're talking about a rise in temperature across the entire globe. It can be in individual places. And generally, I'm talking here over the land surface, which only covers about 28 to 32 percent of the land, uh, the whole planet surface, I think. It can be two to three degree, uh, two to three times as much warming occurring in the middle of, of a land mass as it does on the middle of the ocean, for example, because the um, the effect of the land is able to hold heat better. So when we are talking about a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures or a two degree rise in temperatures, it can be the case that in the middle of the United States, for example, or in the middle of South America or in the middle of any of the big continents, it can be three, four, five, potentially more. Um, so. That led to, in 2018, um, because the the Paris Climate Agreement came in in 2015, where they had set out a a two-degree target, trying attempting to stay well below two degrees. In 2018, the IPCC had um, changed their analysis and decided that 1.5 degrees um, would be the ideal uh, temperature at which to to hold it and, and attain no more warming because all of the pronounced effects from from a rise in temperatures suddenly get a lot worse after the 1.5 degrees. Subsequent to that, we've now got this assessment report six. So the scientists have been working since 2018 on this new report. And so the, the, sorry, the 2018 report was a special report on 1.5 degrees, which was tasked to them by the United Nations. 2021, this latest report doesn't actually take in the absolute latest analysis and data that's coming in. Um, But nevertheless, I'll read you their last quote here. 
It is an established fact that human influence has warmed the climate system and that widespread and rapid climate changes have occurred. Um, so I think you can sort of start to see the change in, in wording and also that there's a very distinct tone in this latest report if you read through and analyse it, especially as a scientist myself, um, you, you begin to get a very different picture of just how um, how serious a lot of these problems we're talking about are. I hope that gave a sort of a good intro background to the whole issue. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it definitely did. So, I mean, just a layman's term to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. Um, very simply, right? The earth yeah. has continued to warm since the 80s, and there is no doubt, and in, in it is the opinion of these scientists, that it is all human related. Now, I'd be re remiss if I didn't ask, do you also think that there is some sort of cyclicality to this all? I mean, coming just, just uh, for argument's sake, right, devil's advocate, like, do you think that ice on our planet is an anomaly? Whether that is or not, like, we need ice to live. Right. Like, because if the sea levels continue to go up, that'll cause mass migrations. We don't do well with that right now. But there is an argument that says, like, this is just a cyclical cycle that the planet is on. Like, what do you say to that? So there is a cyclical element to it. But okay. the, uh, the complication there is we should actually be on a slight uh, cooling uh, phase. In this, uh, in this cycle. The name right now escapes me of, of what exactly we're talking about, but essentially you've got, um, instead of, you've, you've got the Earth's axis can wobble a slight fraction, and mm -hmm. that makes a difference to exactly how far away from uh, the sun the radius is spinning. And that changes approximately every 100,000 years. And within that cycle, you've also got a couple of other variations to the cyclical effect around the sun, which can cause, um, a, a slight variation in the temperature. Now, the the speed and the intensity of the warming that we've seen over the last particularly 15 to 20 years, but even going back approximately 100 years since roughly the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution 150 years ago, that speed of warming is far greater than anything we can see in the scientific record. Does that sort of nail, hit that on the head? Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and were you were you talking about uh, the Milankovitch cycles? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Demarco. So, what? Like, I kind of want to get into, like, I believe there was a new report that was just leaked about uh, with the IPCC. Correct. And can you kind of elaborate on what that was and what they were saying? Yes. So, um, with within these assessment reports that they do every five to seven years. Um, they have a number of different portions of the report. So you, the, the section one, the working group one is uh, report is titled the physical science basis. So that looks at specifically what changes are happening in the Earth's uh, atmosphere, biosphere, climate sphere. What exactly is altering what the effects are of the different amounts and it models the potential warming under a number of different scenarios, um, ranging from a high emission scenario, a, a couple of scenarios of sort of medium level emissions over the next um, 50 to 100 plus years, and a number of scenarios of very low emissions. And also some, most of these uh, lower scenarios have some mix of negative emissions technology, which I'm happy to expand on later. Now, so that's all contained within the assessment one report that just looks at what the, the physical um, and uh, elements and the chemistry and, and so on, the science basis of uh, the entire climate sphere. Then you've also got a working group two and a working group three summary. The working group two and three summaries look specifically at what policy options and what mitigation options are available to the various governments in order to, to attempt to stop and hold warming below this 1.5, ideally. And we've just seen in the in the working group one summary that it's likely not even possible to, to remain anymore within 1.5 degrees. But we can touch on that later as well. But the, the working group two and three look specifically at what options are available, what needs to happen in order that we remain within a habitable sphere in the biosphere and within the climate system itself 
What is, I mean, I really want to get into mitigation, but what is a habitable zone within the biosphere and how close are we to overstepping that zone? Um, so I think the, the best way to start off with is to, is to realize that we've had a relatively stable uh, period of time, particularly in the last 10 to 12,000 years, in which human society developed agriculture and in which human society went from uh, in, in the population sphere of uh, hundreds of thousands and millions to the current uh, population base that we see in the seven point, I think it's 7.85 or whatever billion at the moment. Um, so it's important to realize that, that that cycle is now over effectively. So that, that cycle that we had of very consistent temperatures, very predictable climate sphere, which was able, to, which, which enabled us to grow so many crops, rice, corn, a lot of these crops rely on a stable temperature base and set of uh, conditions, not least of which is, is a certain uh, moisture content in the soil. So when, as soon as you get a drought or a flood, obviously, or inundation of water in the soil, that doesn't allow us to um, grow crops anymore. So that's a huge factor. Um, the, it, the simplest way to visualize it now is to say, okay, what does an unhabitable climate look like? Obviously, you can look at Venus, which is doesn't have any protection from the sun and has something like a surface temperature on the the, the side facing towards the sun would is in the thousands of degrees. Um, we're lucky that we have a, a temperature sphere on the Earth that is on average um, below twenty degrees, right? That is a perfect temperature in which to grow, um, to hold a stable climate together and grow most of our food. Now, if the, the, the global average temperature was to rise something more like five to six degrees, we've heard from various experts, not least of which um, scientists from the Potsdam Institute, which is probably the most recognized climate science institution in Europe, potentially the world. Scientists from that institution have told us that it's difficult to imagine more than a, a couple of hundred million people being able to survive on a planet where the temperature was greater than, say, four or five degrees. You would, at that point, you would have such intense uh, heating around the equator and, and in the um, subtemperate zones, excuse me, in the subtemperate zones, that it's possible that only you would only be allowed to, uh, able to have groups of people living in the two polar spheres. In the north and, and the southern, uh, um, um, yeah, the very typical. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So, so that's that's what an unhabitable planet would look like. Somewhere between that lies a sort of a zone where you can say, okay, well, the effects of climate change are are already devastating. Um, however, then they're, they're not potentially dangerous to hundreds of millions of people, rather a few million, for example. Now, those numbers start to sound pretty grim in my opinion, but there are plenty of people that say it's not worth sacrificing, say, the whole economy, trying to throw a civilization and an economy away to protect smaller numbers of people. Um, and it's it, somewhere between those two sort of scenarios of what we've had until the, nine, the 1950s as a temperature base and what we're heading into with increased warming lies what I would call a habitable planet. Okay. And where you can stably provide enough food for the for a sus sustainable population base. Mm -hmm. And the the argument is, and it's it's fairly simple, right? Like we have to start now because if we're willing to sacrifice a few million people and not change, when does it end? There eventually comes a point in time when it's it would be too late to really do anything right and we may be past that right now i mean there's massive um ecological damage there's um there's a higher extinction rate um it looks like the weather is becoming more predictable wild wildfire season is is longer and the the really scary part is this isn't the first time that civilizations have blinked out of existence due to climate change. Ancient Sumer, the ancient Sumerians, 
um, it's hypothesized that their their civilization came to an end because of of climate change and a little bit of warming. And now there was nothing. It's not like there was emissions. It was just part of the cyclicality of things back then. And the 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 Tigris and Euphrates rivers being super um, salty when they used to irrigate their crops, such as barley, wheat, and whatnot. Like it got too salty, and they weren't able to grow crops, and everyone had to leave, and people died, and it was terrible. Like this is something that has been happening since time and memoriam. It's just now we have the ability to actually do something about it. And so, one question that um, I want to ask is: is we, we, we we kind of touched on mitigation. What what current things are being done, if any, to mitigate this? Um, I think I, I just quickly wanted to touch on what you've just said, which is interesting. There is some really good, um, and it's a fascinating subject, the literature on, on previous civilizational collapse and how they've dealt with environmental breakdown um, across many different civilizations in every continent, basically. Um, now to your question, um, what's being done? Well, um, we've seen pledges recently, particularly in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, talking about um, net zero targets by 2050. Now, um, I think that all really began when Extinction Rebellion um, shut down a bunch of uh, business centres in London for a period of, of two weeks. And that forced the government in the UK to decide, okay, we're, we are in a climate emergency. And subsequent to that, they declared a net zero target for 2050. Since then, we've seen a number of big eco economic players such as Japan, South Korea. Um, I believe the US has also announced a target. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong on that. Well, he'll pull that up. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, th I think it's, it's something like 40 to 45 nations now um, have agreed to set targets for 2050. As an environmental science, I have to tell you that that does not have anything to do with the reality of the scientific situation that we're talking about. And um, so, uh, <clears throat> so to come in, sorry. Um, this was announced on April 22nd of this year that the Biden administration is setting targets for 2030. That's a 50 to 52 percent reduction in all U.S. greenhouse gas pollution. Right. I, yeah, I, I thought they might have done something like that. Um, so it, it's important at this point to say that I, I think it becomes very clear to, to you when you when you uh, study science to it and it's a major extent that it's very easy to actually play accounting tri tr accounting tricks with numbers depending on how you want to go about your stuff there are obviously empirical facts which you can't deny but there are ways to play accounting tricks particularly amongst nations now when we're talking about um targets for 2050 like I said, that doesn't have any relationship with what we're saying in, especially from the latest IPCC report, but even from the two last reports in 2018 and in 2013, it's very clear that tw a relationship with 2050 has nothing to do with what's being seen and done on the ground. Um, now, there's also something going on where there's a lot of governments are saying and the International Energy Agency, for example, has said already that there can be no more uh, coal extraction beyond what is already allocated to be extracted if we are to remain below. I think their wording was 1.5 degrees, but um, a lot of people have conjectured even 2 degrees. And if there is not a subsequent retirement of all of the oil and gas reserves which are already allocated uh prior to the, the full use of their in their life cycle, then we will already head over 1.5 degrees as well, potentially heading close to two. Some scientists even believe that would take us beyond two if we do not retire the assets early that are already built, already in operation or already planned. So there's a disconnect between what governments have talked about and what they've put on the table and what that's all just talk what they're actually doing doesn't seem to have too much in common with what the rhetoric is so what would a real what would a, a realistic target look like 
difficult to say, but I would implore governments to look more at short term and 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 sort of a stepped approach. Okay, we want to reduce emissions five percent next year. We want to reduce emissions three uh, percent every or five percent every year beyond that. Okay, so, that ma- that makes sense. Yeah. What you're saying, you're saying we need a we need goals metrics to to be like are we we five percent until what at five ten percent whatever until we get to fifty percent reduction we need we need to be able to track this and monitor this that way there we know what we're doing because like well, let go ahead well I, I was just going to quickly say exactly it's it's because it's possible that i if i'm uh in the prime minister of australia for example and i say yeah we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050 and then i'm voted out in three years and a new party comes in and they say yeah we don't want to do that or in scenario b i say that i stay in power and then we just don't reduce any emissions at all until 2047 and then suddenly in 2047 we crash our economy and say okay now we're heading under the target that doesn't do any good anyway and the second problem with that would obviously be it, it's more about the cumulative emissions than it is what each year you're emitting. Um, so it, it it's it's difficult without a graph to visualize, but the longer you stay at a high emissions level before you start dropping, the more the, the emissions build up. So if you spend 10 years emitting, I don't know, let's say 10 gigatons, and then one year you spend emitting one gigaton, you've spent... Uh, you've, you've emitted 101 gigatons. If you spend five years emitting 10 gigatons and then the other six years emitting one gigaton, you've only emitted, what's that, 56 gigatons. You've emitted almost half of what the other the first scenario was. So setting a 2050 target is all well and good. We need real action now. We need to jump the emissions down first and then we can, because... We need to target the, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, the, the stuff that's a bit easier to decarbonize because there is a, a, a bunch of sectors which are going to be quite difficult and going to require a hell of a lot of money and a hell of a lot of investment and a hell of a lot of communi- communal effort toward, towards actually achieving that, not least of which is agriculture, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that's a- <laughs> uh, <laughs> agriculture it's a tough one um tough. Ag- agriculture um militaries i've heard th- th- that a lot yeah. of our militaries are the, of some of the biggest culprits uh on pollution um which is a little bit uh concerning i think exactly. that that's just i mean i think that the united states military might be the biggest polluter i'm i in fact check me on that to I, I think they're in the top if they were a nation they would be in the top 12 yeah it's that's not ideal um, no, it's horrendous. And it's often the, not calculated properly in the IPCC reports, or it's not apportioned correctly anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but we also have to be realistic. And I like that you guys are, 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 are trying to take a realistic approach. We cannot just stop using uh, oil overnight. We can't right. do it. But I mean, yeah. on a positive note, I'm feeling very positive today. All right. Uh, generally, we have uh, bummer casts, and those are those are very dangerous. So we try and stay away from that. Oh, it's a, about the U.S. military. I uh, found this uh, article, which elegantly, I love this, uses, says the U.S. military's carbon boot print is enormous. I love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in 2017, let's see, the United States military bought uh, just about 270,000 barrels of oil a day and emitted more than 25,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide per day. Uh, and they would be the let's see our it doesn't give a specific number but our the US military's carbon emissions would be bigger than 100 com- uh, countries combined yeah. it's not ideal not ideal but but on a positive note demarco that you're silent the rest of the podcast you just you brought it down <laughs> i'm bummed out now i'm i'm here um, i'm here to ruin the mood that's i'm the vibe check guy <laughs> um on a more positive note we have elon musk leading the way i think he's done a lot especially in getting wide scale adoption to electric vehicles making them cool um we've got solar power i don't know um how i feel about hydroelectric i feel like that fucks up a lot of ecosystems and whatnot especially out west where i'm at um a lot of uh, the salmon runs have decreased but anyway i don't know what other alternative alternatives are i mean I, i don't know where we are in geothermal warming i'm a big proponent of 
nuclear energy, although the nuclear energy that we have right now that comes from the 60s, 70s, 80s, like those reactors aren't very stable. But I do know that there's some very promising future um, iterations of it. Um, and I mean, kind of we're off topic a little bit, but I wanted to get your thoughts on yeah, nuclear well, energy. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it is off topic. Um, there's a couple of things I want to say here. So the first one, you mentioned geothermal before I forget this one. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of advancement in that field within the last five, six years. And ironically enough, a lot of it's come from fracking, which was the process where you extract gas from coal seams. Oh, yeah. By pumping a bunch of chemicals underground, which which excite the molecules and um, release the gas, and then you collect the gas. Funnily enough, that uh, because the fracking has dropped the price of drilling so much, geothermal has become a lot more competitive. Geothermal is a, a very good energy solution. The problem is it requires quite a lot of planning to make sure that there's no subsidence of the land, which causes problems for buildings and, and um, environmental issues. Uh, and the major problem is, of course, that it's not economically competitive in a lot of areas compared to a wind farm or a solar farm. To quickly touch on renewables, I worked for half a year in the solar industry here in Germany. Um, and you said you you like to have an honest podcast, so I'm going to jump in with some honesty here. Beautiful. I was working for a company in Germany where we were marketing our pot panels as German-made. They were, in fact, being all of the, the parts and products were being produced in China, shipped to Germany in our manufacturing plant, assembled and sold as a German product. And the worst bit for me was that in the our actual factory did not have renewable energy running it. We could have just, I even said this to them, we were in like a factory, right? In the, and there were no trees around, so you could have easily stuck panels on the roof. But they told us it was easier and cheaper just to run with the local net, which is, um, I think, 30 or 40% renewable energy. Um, I did some rough calculations, and I'm not, I'm not pretending that these are scientifically proven studies i just did some basic numbers uh to do with what the difference is producing a solar panel in china versus one in say norway where there's 98 percent renewable energy because of hydro the amount of greenhouse gases released in the production of a solar panel in china compared and then shipping it to europe to sell in europe compared to, to manufacturing one and shipping one to Germany from, say, Norway, it's something like 60% more emissions from the Chinese product. And when you're talking about a couple of thousand or a couple of hundred thousand solar panels, okay, that, that's not a huge problem. When you're talking about the fact that we need to decarbonize entire economies across all of the EU, across all of the major economies, you're talking potentially many gigatons of of carbon dioxide could be released in the production of those um, facilities. And a, a, a difference of 60% makes quite a big difference. Now, solar and wind do have some other environmental impacts. I'm, no one can pretend they don't. Um, I think the biggest problem we've actually got, though, is that most of the, since the renewable, those two renewable technologies have become wide, big scale mainstream, is I think they've added something like 4% uh, to the energy nets. They haven't taken much capacity away. So what we've been doing is just expanding the amount of energy we're producing, not actually reducing the amount of um, fossil fuel and nuclear and, and hydro. So your point about hydro, it is true that hydro has a lot of environmental problems. I don't know enough specifically about that topic to touch on it. All I can say is that at the very least, it, it's relatively unendless, that source. It's not going to run out the way fossil fuels do, the way uh, uranium-powered at, at, um, nuclear does. Nuclear is obviously a very touchy subject, um, it's, it's maybe not so much by you guys in, in the USA, but certainly here in Europe. Um, I think the, the numbers that I've seen is like, um, people always say that the 200 years or, or 250 years of uranium left so if or, or plutonium one of the two so if we're staying with with the the fission based uranium and plutonium reactors um that that 250 years by the way is based on the amount of um nuclear power we've already got it worldwide 
that doesn't have anything to do with if we wanted to get rid of oil, coal, and gas and replace those assets with nuclear assets. Then that 250 years, I believe, jumps down significantly. There's a big elephant in the room with all this, and that is growth. Economic growth is the biggest problem that we're currently facing. It, it has nothing to do with human well-being. It has everything to do with the accumulation and um, hoarding of capital by rich establishment elites. And that's exactly the reason that we've leaked this third report of the working group assess the, the working group three assessment report from the IPCC, which we were going to talk about earlier, um, is because it has all of the usual stuff we were talking before about what measures we can take to reduce emissions. It has a lot of the normal stuff. Um, reduce the amount of animal agriculture is a big one. Reduce the amount of flying. The fashion industry is actually responsible for more emissions than. Uh, shipping and aviation it's 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 more than people consider and Wait. cement is a, yeah what yeah 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 the fashion industry is now more responsible for more emissions globally than uh either aviation or shipping not to, not calculated together separately okay and i can't tell you the exact percentage number but i have read studies that suggest exactly that that outline well, that that's fascinating. And I Right. Yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, I just wanted to jump into your uh your point about nuclear power. Um yeah. <clears throat> I know that like I I'm it's a it's a thing that I've been interested in, so I've followed it for a long time. I know that in Germany they just wasn't that within the last ten years they dismantled all of their functional reactors and I think it's France was one. doing the same. There's still there's still one online in Germany. Yeah, in the United States, uh, people were pretty hot on nuclear power back in like the '60s, and then because of the technology and how just poorly done it was, um, we had all of those accidents like Three Mile Island, and I think there was one more um, that unfortunately the environmental uh, rights and environmental activists in the United States largely started going against nuclear power because they didn't understand it, but there's like you're to go you to your point about um renewable nuclear uranium re reactors are by far the most inefficient uh yeah. type of nuclear reactor because once you spend the energy it's done and then you have this thing that's deadly for 500 some thousand years um there's there's so many if there's a, a type of reactor it's called a breeder reactor that there's different versions of it that there's at least one working and has been working since the 1970s in idaho at the um the the government test site where they build test reactors that as it the i forget what i think it's a it's a type of thorium reactor i believe that as it decays it goes through like a cycle of like three to four potentially even five isotopes that are all fissionable and produce more than enough energy. And then once it reaches the point where it's fissionable energy is gone and it's half-life has gone and it's whatever, then it's inert. It's no longer radioactive or at least it's radioactive within a safe level. So it, it, it's, and you can be, they can be done on, they can go from like a state sized scale reactor all the way down to like, a home-sized reactor. Right. If I could just quickly um, respond to that. Yeah. So I probably should have said in the middle of my my splurge that I, I think nuclear technology does have a role to play, um, but not the products, as you mentioned, not the products that are currently in operation in a lot of places. Um, and just to touch on the, 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 the dollar per, per kilowatt hour cents, uh, nuclear is actually getting slightly more expensive due to increasing safety measures and and production uh, and 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 construction costs. Um, whereas wind and solar will keep dropping and will drop faster the more it's adopted. Now, to the point about these yes, the the these other reactor versions. Um, the, the the problem we've got is we need a very quick transition in the next five to ten years. And I have some serious personal doubts whether you could build enough and get this technology moving quickly enough to cover that shortfall. In the next sort of, if, if we had the time to talk about 15 to 30 years, um, I, th I think we're, we're looking at a different scenario. What we need to focus on right now is the next two to six years because uh, there's a, 
a scientist from England by the name of Sir David King. He was the uh, the head the head scientist for the British government for a number of years. He's recently retired, which gives him the, the benefit of being able to say whatever he wants, basically. He doesn't have to answer to any job or, or boss or institution. And he reckons that he, whatever we do in the next three to four to five years will determine how the future warming go, uh, takes its course and how human society is able to adapt. So... As I mentioned, it's very important that we focus on these next to three to four years. And I have some very serious doubts whether nuclear can jump in quickly enough to save that time scale. It might be able to save the, the following sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, yeah, to, to add to your point about 20 to 30 years, that's what any any time I've ever heard about anybody like having plans for building a reactor or like announcing plans for building reactors. Like I think I, I, I'll have to find it. There was a specific place in the United States that they announced that they were going to start doing more nuclear, but it was like, it was a reactor that was based on slightly newer than current technology. And it was still going to take like some, something like 20 plus years of construction before it would be even online. And if I could just say something quickly there as well, I think that, that, I mean, this sounds a bit conspiratorial or, or whatever, and I'm not sure of my history here, but it is interesting that um, there does seem to have also been a reduction, not just in in uh, capacity outbuilding of nuclear in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. That's sort of understandable, as you mentioned, John, because of um, the environmental movement setting itself against nuclear power due to the uh, some of the disasters we did see and some of the problems with the waste. That's understandable. What is not understandable is that the the funding and the research and the technology seems to have dropped off, certainly in, in the States, throughout that period after the 70s. Because as you mentioned, there was some interesting technology developments happening in the 70s. Well, and, and another another reason that I happen to be more, I like, so our Rick and I both, our alma mater is Oregon State University, which if you're not familiar with is one of, at least in the United States, is one of the kind of like low key, one of the better scientific universities, public universities yeah. at least. And they have grants for basically everything. They have a huge nuclear engineering program and they have... Uh, two, they have a, they have a functioning reactor, like training reactor. That's your typical kind of reactor they have uh, most places. Then there's several others like experimental reactors that they've licensed, but it's all like licensing that they're building a test for GE, and then GE is going to build a full scale one in 25 years, maybe. Yeah, this corporate relationship with research is a massive problem. Um, and uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say there. Oh yeah. Um, is I wouldn't be surprised. So the point I was really getting to there was that I, there seems to be some sort of shady stuff going on in the background um, after or in the seventies and after the seventies in terms of what uh, the the sort of big corporations were planning to do. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get some pretty nasty information coming out in the next sort of five to ten years about what was actually going on behind closed doors in that time. There has been some that's already come out. Um, but as the climate crisis starts to really become visual and, and, and really start to have an impact, um, I think you will start to see some of the, the high profile scientists and, and people working for some of these big corporations that have been involved with dodgy, dodgy things in the past. I think they will start coming, you know, in the media and, and whistleblowing a little bit. Um, now, in terms of that, Funding, yeah, th there was a number of projects that were going in the 70s, as you mentioned, not least of which was the molten salt reactor. With, I think that was actually in the late 60s. And that just seems to have just, it, it was a, f a perfectly reasonable um, uh, avenue to continue research in. And then they just seem to have disappeared the program. I know that they've, they've done that with a number of programs Um um, well, to go, to talk to your point about like corporate yeah. influence on research, I am not aware of how uh, most research. I, I assume most research in Europe is largely state funded. Uh, in the United States, it is there is there is some state funding, though it isn't the best. Most of these, specifically, I'm very familiar with land grant public schools in the United States since I've just happened to live around them my whole life. They get most of they make their money and make their endowment monies from 
both from a small from state funding, mostly from private corporate funding and sponsorships, boosters and things for each individual university school. So like nuclear engineering will get this from that and then agriculture from this and that. And then they end up their money source continues because then all of the research and the patents that come out of the technology that's made at the university, regardless of who and the scientists that did it, it stays in the hands of the university in perpetuity for a long time too. I think it's like something like 30 years and they continue to cash in on that. So they're, it's like Oregon state had a big thing about five years ago where there was a huge movement by the students to uh, encourage the university's foundation that manages the endowment to divest in all fossil fuels and non-renewable technology. And I I'll have to look it up, but there was a huge fight and I can't remember which side they ended up going, but it was, they fought pretty hard to stay with their, their, uh, their investments in fossil fuel because it was paying off so well for them. Well, I mean, yeah, and I, I assume we're going to start talking about the moral implications of, of what the established sort of economic powers are doing and, and what that means for our future. But um, before we come to that, I'll just quickly finish this off. So we got we had an interview with German media um, talking about how our, we as Scientists Rebellion um, have leaked the, the final piece of the uh, assessment report from the IPCC. And we were not that prepared for what the interview actually was, which was he was a bit on the attack. He was uh, the interviewer basically gave us like 24 hours notice, hey, we want to interview you. And we had already done an interview with another German public media uh, institution, which was pretty relaxed. And she was quite nice, to be honest. And we had a nice chat about it. This guy was like, this was on primetime public radio. And he was, the first few questions were okay, but then he went on the attack. And I'm, I'm fine with journalists asking, you know, difficult questions. That's what they're there for. But it would be nice if you're going to ask seriously testing questions to have some sort of um, heads up of roughly what the, it doesn't, doesn't have to say exactly what the question is, but, you know, give a general idea. Hey, I want to talk about this. So what he came out and asked us was we've got on our website um, that uh, – when we released this document, we, we posted, there is no time to wait around. There's no time for continued inaction. The people deserve to know now what our corporate owned politicians have done to them. We leaked this report because governments pressured and bribed by fossil fuel and other industries protecting their failed, uh, protecting their failed ideology and avoiding accountability. So he had a big problem with the way that we worded that specifically the corporate owned politicians piece. I just want to give a quick um, summary response to you guys, if I may, uh, because it's been bugging me for a week ever since I, get, I gave that to him. Obviously a question like that, when he comes and says, what do you mean uh, corporate owned politicians? Can you give me an example um, of how the German government is corporate owned and so on um, without any preparation time is quite a difficult task on um, on a public radio to be able to answer that question effectively. Um, I didn't think we did a, too, a terrible job online, on, on air. But here's my quick response um, that I've formulated in the, in the, t the time since. So I was, I, I should have said something along the lines of, look, we're not talking about uh, literal cash bags heading to the government. What we're talking about is a very clear documented evidence now in the scientific literature about how these energy and resource companies, among others, have developed methods in order to gain disproportionate and undue influence over decision-making in our democracies. So there was a study that got released, I think it was the 25th of, of August. You can have a look at it. It's called Weaponizing Economics, Big Oil, Economic Consultants, and Climate Policy Delay. I'll just quickly read the abstract because there's a couple of lines here that directly back up my point, essentially. The role of particular scientists in opposing policies to slow and halt global warming has been extensively documented. The role of, of economists, sorry, the role of economists, however, has received less attention. I've got an economics degree, by the way, so I should be able to pronounce the damn word. <laughs> yeah. I trace the history of an influential group of economic consultants hired by the petroleum industry. Uh, sorry, I've accidentally deleted it, haven't I? Yep. Deleted it. It's... Ah, it's, it's, oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> the economists used models that inflated predicted costs while ignoring policy benefits, and their results were often portrayed to the public as independent rather than industry-sponsored. 
Their role, their work has played a key role in undermining numerous major climate policy initiatives in the US over a span of decades, including carbon pricing and participation in international agreements. This study illustrates how the fossil fuel industry has funded biased economic analyses to oppose climate policy and highlights the need for greater attention on the role of particular economists and economic paradigms, doctrines, and models in the policy in the climate policy delay. The fossil fuel industry has used biased economic analyses to weaken and defeat climate policy and highlights the need for greater attention on the role of economists and economic paradigms, doctrines, and models in climate policy delay. That's scientific speak for corporate owned politicians, in my opinion. Now, when we quickly turn to Australia, if we don't mind, because Australia, although it's it's a small emitter itself, is actually the third largest emitter if you include the emissions that we ship overseas to be burned in, say, Japan, for example, China, Russia, so on. But I think it, it goes Saudi Arabia, Russia, Australia for exported emissions. Now, um, I call this the crime of the century as in an Australian context because uh, over 70% of Australians demand far more action on climate and environmental breakdown, according to analyses. And yet, uh, the calls to phase out fossil fuel subsidies after speculation about net zero emissions targets. Fossil fuel subsidies cost the Australian state, territory and federal budgets about 10.3 billion Australian dollars last fiscal year. That is $19,000 per minute, a new report for the Australia Institute shows. That's something like, um, what's that? That's like the I cost of that. one welfare program for like a decade. That's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> And and so I don't think it's a miss for us. I don't think it's wrong to say the the, the wording that we use, corporate owned politicians. Very very last point on this, and then we can move on. Um, that so what I what I was talking about is um, the problem of dispassionate and professional sounding language. And you're probably noticing I'm doing it throughout this talk because I'm um, a scientist. That's how we talk, and that is the problem. So. Um, we, we need to use a form of communication that changes the narrative from what scientists have always done, which is, you know, sit on some sort of moral intellectual high horse and say, oh, we know better than you guys. We know numbers and statistics. Um, and I, I think using a different communication form would be better. And we're discussing the, the negligence, the criminal negligence of the established powers. And hence on our website and in our communications, we choose to use a direct language form, which is more familiar to ordinary people. That's how ordinary people talk, all right? Um, I think this, the way the media as well does this, uh, doesn't win any favors. It allows people to start turning towards, say, Fox and say some of these other media institutions which talk a bit more like the average person and, and feels more relatable to a lot of people. I think that's a major problem that we've got. That's that, obviously a massive topic. Yeah, that's that's a huge problem. Um, yeah. Is everything needs to be in layman's terms and everything. And, and another problem is there needs to be more incentive to make money because that's how the world goes around. It needs to be incentivized to be in the governments are doing that, the Green New Deal and whatnot. Um, it just might be a little bit, a little too late. Um, we are running out of time, but honestly, yeah. I would love to continue this conversation again yeah. because we have so much more we're at the tip of the iceberg i'd like to get into yeah. um you know for me the, the biggest issue that i look at like immediate um because climate change just seems like such a distant goal and I, I sometimes think we're fucked there but like ocean dumping like i'm a huge ocean dumping guy like what the fuck are we doing with that you know like um yeah. but i think that we got it this is probably going to have to be a two-parter in my opinion um because yeah. there's we're, we're just at the very very surface of what this is and how important these things are um i appreciate you where can people find you, you want to give people your socials um, I mean, so Scientist Rebellion, we're, we're on YouTube. We've got some interesting content, which we're about to produce. Um, you can just have a quick look for Scientist Rebellion on YouTube. We're also on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, I personally, uh, don't use, uh, social media that much. Smart uh, man. I stay away from it. Yeah. But if people want to get in touch with me, they're more than welcome to, um, basically all my socials. I think I'm the only Kyle Topfer in the world. So, um, it's a kind of rare name. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to get in touch if you've got questions. 
Kyle, I appreciate that. Let's set something up. Um, we'll yeah. get with you, um, and we'll, we'll we'll do the second part of this, my man. Um, I appreciate yeah. you coming on the sh- on this show and speaking Thanks, your man. truth, man. Thanks, guys. Great to talk to you. Have a good one. Do the same.